Yeah, so th this lecture that we're starting with is going to be a, like a foundational introduction to the system of Kabbalah, which is an ancient uh, Jewish system. This is kind of a, a new lecture to the phase C, but I thought it would be good to add because we put so much emphasis on the Tree of Life picture over there, all the way through phase A and phase B. They're always pointing to it and referring to it. And that's based on this, which is a, an older system. This is where that comes from. So the whole idea of this lecture is I'm going to try and explain on the macrocosmic scale, on the larger scale, what that picture represents. Because that picture really isn't a thing of its own, but it represents spiritual truths or like a spiritual pathway kind of thing. And we're going to explain, you know, what those balls mean and what, what those pathways mean and why it's set up the way it is. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. So this introduction to Kabbalah, the Sephirotic tree and primordial man. Sephirotic tree being this, also that, and primordial man is the original man. And we're going to get into explaining a lot of these terms. So don't I feel like you have to know everything off the top, off the bat here, so. Uh, let's go. Okay. So we'll start with the definition right off the hop. Uh, the definition for Kabbalah, because we all, it's become more popular nowadays, so we can hear it like, we, like we're talking about Madonna's thing, and, mm -hmm. and uh, she's in the Kabbalah, but uh, so it's a Hebrew word, obviously, because it's a Jewish tradition. The Hebrew word translates into English literally as receiving. So literal translation is receiving. Um, and moreover, it's the traditional reception of the inner teachings of the Torah, which is, you know, the, the, the Jewish faith, the book of the Jewish faith, the five books of uh, Moses, and also the entire, the entire rest of the Old Testament. But it's a, it has a connotation of a traditional reception. Now what the Kabbalah actually is, is, is it's a system like math or science, and it's used to decipher the true message of Jewish scriptures. So it's not, it's not really something you can read. You can't say, oh, I went to the library and I, I rented the Kabbalah and it was awesome. <laughs> that'd be like, you know, that'd be like saying, I read the math last weekend. You know, it, it was intense. So it's, it's, more, it's more like a system used. To use. There's no one book, really, but there are Kabbalistic texts. Um, and it explains the mysterious relationship between the infinite creator and his finite creation. So it does get a little abstract because we're talking about how what we would call God created creation. So, and, and this is obviously outside of everything we know that we are. So it's pretty much the opposite. And that's where a lot of, you know, mystical language comes from. We're all one and everyone's one and everything. And it sounds a little bit cliche sometimes. But this kind of t tries to, just to t talk about why we use those, what could sound like vague cliches and stuff like that. And if we're going too fast, you know, you can let me know. If anyone has a question, don't be afraid to shout something out. But uh, we'll just keep plowing ahead here. Um, so biblical characters are interpreted as allegorical representations of the creative process itself, or as or they can represent attributes of God, or the formation of the physical world from its higher spiritual dimensions. This is one of the main points of Kabbalah. So, the entire Jewish uh, canon canonical text isn't taken literally; it's seen as a higher allegory for higher spiritual truths. And that's why, if you read the Bible, sometimes it's like, well, this doesn't make sense. Why is this guy doing this? And this guy begot that guy. Who begot that guy? And What's the point of all this? These guys, this, this, this system explains that, and it gets into, into like a deeper meanings of why these names are used or why these stories occur. So, in the basic, this is the ancient Hebraic tradition we're talking about, so it's older than 2,000 years, obviously, because that would be the Christian era, and prior to that we have the Judea, Judaic era. Uh, and there are two traditions that make up the Jewish faith. The first is the written tradition. And the written tradition includes the Torah, which is, the, like we said, the first five books of the Old Testament, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, and then it includes the Tanakh. The Tanakh, Tanakh is the entire Old Testament. And it's actually an acronym. The, the Ta stands for Torah, which is the law, right? The first five books. The Na stands for Nabaim, which, is, which in English is just the prophets. And the Ka is the Ketuvim, which is the writings. So that's the, the whole Old Testament. We have, like, we, you can see it also in the Christian faith. They have, you know, they have the, the five books of Moses, then they have the, the prophets and the writings. Same thing. This is, this is the written tradition. There's also a work called the Talmud, which is comprised of the Mishnah and the Gemara. It's not important to know all this stuff. I'm just giving you guys a, a, a wide overview. The, the Talmud is, is kind of like a book that, that uh, documents, you know, what it takes to become a rabbi and how people should interact in society. Stuff that's not necessarily in the Torah, but stuff that the Jewish people base, base their everyday lives on. 
and the Mishnah, the Mishnah is kind of like a commentary on the Torah, the Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah, and they both come together to make the Talmud, basically. And, and these writings all collectively relate to the religious law, the communal law, daily observances and commerce, this kind of daily affairs plus the, the, the core of their religious belief in its written form. Um, so that was the first one, the written tradition. The second is the oral tradition. This has always been maintained within Judaism. It's made up of two traditions, written and oral. So the Kabbalah falls into the oral tradition, where it mainly has not been written down. Um, the oral law was given to Moses by God in conjunction with the written law. And actually, a, a lot of uh, Kabbalists say that Kabbalah predates Moses, if you want to take it as, as a, the, the Bible as a historical book, which may not be the best interpretation of it, but like, the patriarch Abraham was a Kabbalist in all of this. Um, so it was passed down orally from generation to generation. That's the main part with this. A lot of the other traditions were too within Judaism, but Kabbalah was mainly passed down orally, and that's why it's kind of hard to place or date it. Um, there are strict rules of study uh, for, for Kabbalah in the Jewish communities. And even today, there are strict rules of study. You have to be a man. You have to have studied the Torah for, for your whole life, and you have to be 40 years old. And that's, I don't know if that's just the traditional aspect of it, or if there are deeper esoteric meanings to it. I would have to assume there, there are, because it seems kind of arbitrary. But these are the strict rules of study. And uh, the Hasidic movement is based on Kabbalistic teaching. So I don't know if you guys know the Hasidic Jews, they had the curls, and they were wearing the black and the beards. Um, there is a... There was a, a rabbi named Baal Shem Tov, master of the good name, and he thought that the, the Jewish faith, faith was losing this oral teaching of Kabbalah because, you know, it's like the inner teaching. So like anything over time, it gets lost, and all that's left is the shell. So he created this type of, of Judaism, the Hasidic Orthodox Judaism, so that they'll do actual external ritualized things that have Kabbalistic meanings. And his idea was if they don't understand the Kabbalistic teachings, at least they're they're going through the motions that maybe they'll be able to pick up on it. So like, you'll see sometimes they'll, they'll bind leather around their arms with Torah scrolls on it or around their heads because he's taught that you have to bind yourself to the Torah. On a deeper esoteric level, it means you have to, you know, totally take it in and, and become one with the teachings. But on the exoteric level, they just wrap it around their arms and sort of like just show that they're bound to it. Well, it's the Hebraic tradition. Okay, there's three, there's three basic categories of Kabbalah. There's the, the magical, the meditative, and then the intellectual. So there's different practices. The magical, Kabbalah, there's Kabbalistic texts and teachings that deal mainly with, <coughs> excuse me, mainly with making amulets and, and, and uh, that kind of thing, protective chants. It's kind of the tradition that utilizes names and chants and meditation to affect the external world. Whereas the meditative Kabbalah, which is kind of one of the more interesting aspects, I think the most interesting aspect of the Kabbalah is more transcendental. So it's using these chants and meditative practices to transcend your base nature into the higher nature, kind of like what we're doing here, is like within Gnosis. And then there's the intellectual, which just pretty much strives to be like a, a scientific system that explains cosmology and creation in general. So the rules of the physical plane, the rules of the spiritual planes, and a lot of that comes from the uh, <clears throat> like the medieval era, a certain rabbi named uh, the RE, Isaac Luria, one of the most famous Kabbalists, he, uh, he had a long system that was really, really intellectual based. And if you ever read some of those books now, it is kind of like stereo instructions almost. But I mean, it's really good stuff. And there's a couple tools that, they, that, that Kabbalists utilize. Some of them may be familiar, some of them may not to you guys. Uh, the first one is called Gematria. In English, that translates into geometry. <coughs> Sorry. And this, this is the idea that each letter in the Hebrew alphabet is also a number. They didn't develop a separate uh, alphabet and numerical system. There was only one. So the first letter, Aleph, was the number one. And, and so on and so on. Up to, uh, uh, it goes pretty high depending on the, which interpretation you use. But because every letter is a number, you can read every word as a number. Every word has a numerical value, and every other word that has the same numerical value is linked together. And that's one way they interpret the old scriptures. Um, and that's probably the most famous Kabbalistic system. Now, this is, this is the base of numerology as we know it today in the Western system, where we use numbers like, our, like how we see our, our names can be condensed into numbers and our birth dates and all that stuff. This all comes from the system of gematria, which is in Latin, you know, geometria, and in English, geometry. 
Another system is called Notericon, which literally translates into shorthand writer, where each Hebrew word itself is seen as an acronym, and each letter creates a new word. So they make full word phrases out of single words. I'll have examples of this, so if I'm not explaining myself too well, we'll be able to see it. And then the third tool, <coughs> sorry, it's called Tamura. This is a cipher system. It's used to interpret the Hebrew words by switching various letters for other letters, according to prearranged tables. And we still see those cipher systems around today, like the Atbash cipher, and we'll talk a little bit of, like, about that. But these are all systems that these ancient Kabbalists used to read the, the, the Old Testament, to try and get a deeper understanding of what it, what it actually means. Because, like, on a side note, the Old Testament's written in all... Um, there's an all consonants in Hebrew. There's no vowels. So there are slightly different interpretations by different rabbis. So the first tool, gematria, as we said, so the word heart in, in Hebrew is lev or leb. Uh, every letter is also a number. The letter L, which in Hebrew is lamed, is equal to the number 30. Uh, <clears throat> the letter vet is equal to the number 2. So, Lama plus Ved or L plus V in English is 32. It doesn't really work the same with the English alphabet. It'd be different than the Hebrew because we have different amounts of letters. So, th therefore, the heart or the Lev is equal to the number 32, and 32 is equal to the heart, which in Hebrew is Lev. And it seems kind of arbitrary or weird, but now we can see that whenever heart appears, it's also equal to 32. When the number 32 appears, it's equal to heart. And this way, we can get a more in-depth uh, deciphering of what these ancient texts actually mean. And I'll, I didn't, this one wasn't chosen arbitrarily. We'll, we'll use it again later in the slides. Notericon, as we said, the word is an acronym for a phrase made from each letter. So, for example, the yod heh vav -Hey, which is the ineffable name, in uh, some Kabbalistic systems is seen to, to mean this, Yishtabach hama atzel vayetala habore, which means... May the emanator be praised and the creator exalted. So when you're saying this, this is an, this is an abbreviation of that, according to some Kabbalists. And it changes depending on which Kabbalistic system you're following. But it's also used as a tool to, to deeper understand the, uh, the teachings of, of the ancient texts. Same with the word Amen. In the Hebrew tradition, this is actually an acronym for uh, Adonai Melech Amon which is Lord Faithful King, or the Lord is the Faithful King, or my Lord the Faithful King. Kind of thing. The last one, Tamura, uh, is a system of ciphers, as I said. So like the, Ash, the Atbash cipher, you replace the first letter with the last letter of the alphabet, and then you, you go that way. So like, like A would be Z, B would be Y, C would be X. We saw a lot of these kind of ciphers in the medieval times with the, the chivalric orders of like the Templars and these kind of knights would always use different ciphers like this. Of God is where you replace each letter with the preceding letter. So A would be B, B would be C, and C would be D. And Alabam, you replace the first letter of the alphabet with the 12th, and the second with the 13th, and so on. So they basically split it in half. And this is just a way that they tried to get deeper understandings of, of the text that they were dealing with. Now the allegorical cabal is one of the most important aspects of it, how, how they take the, the stories as allegories for higher truths. <laughs> Um, for one quick example we can do is Moses and the Israelites bondage in Egypt. So if we know that story, or don't really know that story, basically we know that the Israelites were captives in Egypt, they were the slaves. Moses was chosen by God to free them. The Israelites followed Moses and they were freed. The uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians opposed them and they were destroyed, basically is the quick version of how that went down. There's a lot more to it. But uh, Moses allegorically would represent awakened consciousness. On, on the macrocosmic scale, on a really large scale. The Israelites would equal the, the essence, or the, the parts that turn to become awakened, and the Egyptians would equal the ego. So you can see in this story how the ego kept the essence in bondage, and the waking consciousness, in this case, Moses, was uh, chosen by God, so you can say like a push from the monad, or divine intervention, to wake up the rest of the essence to start fleeing from the ego and escaping the ego. So it can be taken that way too. So internally it can also be shown as, you know, Moses is your own percent of awakened consciousness. Um, the nation of Israel are the desires that turn towards, here, here it's God, but we, we could say our higher self. I, just, I use this word a lot because in, Kab in the Kabbalistic system it comes up a lot. It's kind of a poor translation for, for what they're talking about, but we understand in the Western society it's kind of a known term. 
So this would be a, this would be our uh, you know our, our essence that's mainly being freed, and the other nations such as like in the Old Testament talk about a lot of other nations, but primarily the Egyptians that 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 would be the ego, the desires that turn towards selfishness and vice. So that's kind of a allegorical representation. And also in, in the Kabbalah, uh, biblical figures represent different attributes of God, different different sides of God. Here's the tree of life. The first time we're seeing it today in this lecture. And we're going to get into deeper what, what all this means. But just really briefly in the allegorical Kabbalah, the patriarch Abraham is equal to Hesed, which is this Sephiroth here, which is the attribute of loving kindness. Isaac is equal, Isaac is equal to, to Gabor, which is strength or severity. Jacob is equal to Tiferet, which is beauty. And Moses is equal to Netzach, which is victory here. Aaron is equal to Hod, which is glory. Joseph equal to Yassad, foundation. And David is equal to Malkuth, or kingdom. And they use this system so they can better understand these stories. So every time we're talking about uh, King David, it's talking about this, this concept of Malkut and how, how it formed and how it helped to form. Every time we talk about you know, the patriarch Jacob, they're talking about this specific attribute of God and how it interacts. And, and uh, that's just another way that they, they look deeper into the text. Now, although the Kabbalah is the oral tradition, there are a number of Kabbalistic texts that we still have today, and a lot have been written by a lot of different schools. Because the Kabbalah was the original esoteric school, the original mystery school for the Hebrews. This is an example of, of some Kabbalistic, you know, pictures. A lot of the occult stuff that we're used to seeing, the pentagrams and that, and, and uh, different kind of stuff. But well, we're going to get into talking to a couple of these texts. So, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is called the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. It's commonly translated incorrectly as the Book of Creation in English. This is, this is uh, one of the oldest known Kabbalistic texts. It dates, dates back to the first century, basically, or just prior to the first century. And uh, it deals with how God created the world, and it's the first written text that explains that picture, that Tree of Life picture, and that's why a lot of this lecture is based off of this text. Another more important one is called the Sefer Habahir, or the Book of Illumination. It dates back to roughly the same time, but it's not as clear as the Sefer Yetzir. It's, it's kind of a confusing text, and it's written as a commentary on the Torah. So they're talking about different stories uh, on, on the Torah and stuff. A lot of the stories we have today come from some of these books like this, like the story of Lilith. It was actually written to try and by these, by these rabbis to try and understand why in Genesis chapter 1 God created man and woman, and then in chapter 2 he created man and then woman from the side. Where in chapter 1 he just said, oh, there was man and woman already, and now we got man and then woman. But then they say, oh, the, the first woman was Lilith, and, and this is written in, in this book, the, the Sefer Haba here, and they explain how she fell, and now she's like a tempting, temptress kind of thing. The Sefer Raziel Hamalek, the book of, the Raziel, of Raziel the Angel, is one of the first magical texts. Um, and the oldest copy goes back to around the medieval era, when a lot of the stuff started really becoming written down. So we know, we know it, it dates back to the early Judeo period, but a lot of it hasn't, didn't really get written down to the uh, medieval era. And this book is a grimoire, or grimoire, so it's a magical text dealing with amulets and, and names of God and astrology and numerology and that kind of thing. Just really going over this real briefly. And then there's a Sefer HaZohar, the Book of Radiance. And this is the most influ influential Kabbalistic text ever written. Most Kabbalists read this one a lot. This is, this is a multi-volume text, like 21 volumes. It's written in Aramaic, and it's a commentary on the Torah and, and different uh, Jewish teachings. And it's also from the medieval era. And, and its authenticity is always disputed with a lot of these books because they attributed it to an ancient rabbi, but the oldest version was found in Spain. It's written in Aramaic by, by a person who doesn't speak Aramaic as their first language. They can tell by the language, but it could have been an inspired work. So now we'll get into the main body of it, the Sephiroth tree. This is the tree of life, the tree that Lee's been pointing at in phase A and B. Um, okay, so we got a quote from, from Venerable Master Samael here. The Ein Sof, not being able to express itself in the limited physical plane, does it through its ten sephiroth. And this is what we're going to talk about. There's a lot of words we may not quite understand yet, but we're going to define them, Ein Sof and, and the sephiroth, but we're going to get right into that stuff. So, this has a quick overview. Uh, this diagram, the Sephirotic Tree of Life, the Tree of Life of the Sephirotic Tree, represents the process of creation. Um, this is, we're dealing with the macrocosmic level. There is a microcosmic level that we're going to get to in the, in the future le uh, lecture. 
This is on, this is on the large scale. Um, there's 10 Sephiroth and 22 channels. So the Sephiroth are these circles. And as you can see, there's 10 of them. The 22 channels are the lines that connect them. And we're going to get into that also. These equal the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, as is known. So as we see already, if you use the Gamasha, we can see that this is also equivalent to not only the macrocosmic out there, but also related to the individual heart. Because as we've seen, 32 is also equal to the word heart in Hebrew. So it's also an internal aspect. But we're talking deal with this lecture, we're dealing mainly with the external. So from top to bottom, creation descends from the spiritual to the material. So this is the most abstract, all the way down to the most concrete, to actual physical creation, the physical universe we see right here. Um, the Sephiroth are attributes of God that contain divine light. You can think of them that way because they're described that way a lot. They contain this divine light. And the channels are the pathway that the light flows. So the light flows through these pathways to each Sephiroth, and they're interconnected, as you can see. It's not like one straight line. Um, these ten Sephiroth, and there are 22 channels of interconnectedness, were the first creature ever created. On the macrocosmic level before this was here, only the white part was here. Just infinity. Just I mean, We would say the creator, but it wasn't even a creator yet, because he didn't have a creation. So it was just beyond anything that represents creation. This, this whole sy systematic... Uh, diagram of organization represents the first creature ever created. Now we're going to get a little bit more deeper into it. So we're first we're going to define Sephira. So Sephira and Sephiroth, this is just singular, this is plural. That's why you'll see those two terms come up a lot. Literally in English it's enumeration or counting. So we're going to take a, a, a verse from the Sephir Yetzir itself. With 32 mystical paths of wisdom engraved God, and he created his universe with three books, with text, with number, and with communication. And if you see, I have the Hebrew words in here, Sefer, Sephir, and Sepur. These are all related to this word, so it means more than just counting. Uh, Sefer equals text, Sephir equals number, and Sepur, communication. So it's starting to take on a little more shape. There's another Hebrew word, Sephir, which is boundary. So now we're going to see that God created not by building, but by restricting. The idea is that they're making a boundary based on numbers, uh, text, and the, the communication of those numbers. Because before everything was completely abstract and it's slowly becoming defined. It has to be defined by these things. So, so when you hear the word sphere, sometimes you say sphere, you know, in English, the, the, the spheres, but it doesn't really translate well because it doesn't carry these connotations of text, number, communication, or boundary. If that makes sense to everybody. Stay with me. So we have the Ain Sof we've seen. That literally in English is without end or the infinite. And that's what they call God. Mm -hmm. Ain Sof. Every time you hear Ain Sof, it's, it's God or an aspect of God. And there's, there's, there's deeper uh, levels of Ain Sof, but we're not really going to get into it here because it's such a, big, uh, such a big section. We can't get into everything. So creation began by restricting and defining the boundaries of the infinite. So if you think really abstract, before we were here, there was only the infinite. There wasn't time or space. This is above all of that. And slowly started defining. And by defining, it means restricting this infinity into more and more uh, condensed until you can finally hold something in your hand. It becomes condensed and condensed, defined by weight and measure and space and time and all of these things. So, and it comes, as I said, from the most abstract to the most concrete. This is the idea of the Sephiroth from the top to the bottom. Let's get right into it. Here's a Sephirotic tree here. Uh, Keter. The first Sephiroth to emanate from the infinite is called crown. Literally in English, it's called crown. This is the first Sephiroth, or Sephira, I guess you want to. Keter is the first emanation, and thus is related to the number one, the first number to come into existence. <clears throat> Before one came into existence, there was no numbers. It was just totally unified. Because one already denotes quantity, or that we have a, a numerical amount of something. Right? So uh, Keter represents the attribute of the will. It is the initial desire to create and the primal source of all creative activity. So, so what's the will? It's a desire to, to create something. The first Sephira is called crown because like an actual crown that sits above the head, so too is the level of Keter above the cognitive ability of human understanding. Keter is so closely interrelated with the infinite from which it came that the two are almost indistinguishable and cannot be grasped by the conscious intellect. So basically, the Ain Sof is like a fist pressing down into a mold and that mold is Keter. One doesn't really exist without the other, and it's hard to decipher where one starts and the other stops. And that's why it's hard to, or the Kabbalists would say impossible to understand with human intellect. 
<coughs> we couldn't understand it with our intellectual, intellectual capacities at all. Keter is referred to as the Ancient of Days because it was the first and oldest of the Sephiroth. All the Sephiroth are contained within Keter. And we'll see another diagram that, that will show that. Okay, Hokma, or Chokma, or Hokma. It's a transliteration, so the, the first word is actually a, a Chet, but we don't have a sound, so we say Chokma or Hokma. So a second Sephiroth, Sephiroth Amity from the Infinite, is called Wisdom. Literally in English, Hokma is Wisdom. So if you hear Hokma El, that's the Wisdom of God. Hokma is related to the number two, kind of the second thing that's different than the Infinity. Hokma represents the first creative activity to appear. It is the beginning, the seed, the intuitive flash, the original germ of an idea, the potential reality whose details have, no, have yet to be fully developed. So it's kind of like, I think I see it here. Yeah, the second step for us called wisdom because it is the initial flash of insight. Wisdom is the idea to create, which emanated from the crown, which is the will. So there is a will to create, and this is the first inkling of the idea to create. We haven't understood how we're going to do it, it was just the idea of creating. I'm, going to, I'm using an example of creating because we're talking about the macrocosmic level of creation from God to the creation, basically. <coughs> I'm using terms like God because in Kabbalah, this is the terms they use, but we can, we can substitute whatever term we're most comfortable with. I don't think anybody will be too uncomfortable with that term, though. Hopefully. If I'm offending anybody, let me know. Okay. So, Hokma is the first revelation of the intellect and is also related to the right brain. As we see, each one of these is going to be related to a body part, but it's for a specific reason, which we'll get to. But this is the first, uh, se the first sephirah related to the intellectual capacities, wisdom. So the highest form of the intellect is wisdom. And then we have bina. The third sephirah to emanate is understanding. Bina literally in English is understanding. So as we can tell already by its name, it's also an intellectual capacity. Bina is related to the number three, the third thing that's different than the infinite. <coughs> Bina represents the development, gestation, and unfolding of the conceptual details implicit in the ideas originated in Hokma. So basically this is the, this is, I want to create, this is, okay, I'm going to create, and this is the, okay, how are we going to create, basically is what's going on here, We're unfolding the ideas. The third sphere is called understanding because it is here that the germ of the idea is gestated and expanded upon. Will is the, the desire to create, wisdom, the idea to create, and understanding is the process of, un, of analyzing how to go about actually creating. Uh, Bina is, is the grasped intellect and is also related to the left brain. So wisdom is a little bit higher, is higher than Bina, but wisdom is higher than understanding. But understanding is, is when you, you, know, you understand something. First is wisdom, Some, like an old guy can be wise, but you don't really get what he's saying to you. But wisdom is if it, but understanding is when you grasp that, what he's saying. So now, this is the highest form of an idea. Now you kind of understand what they're talking about here. <coughs> now we have Da'ath, da and this is, this is kind of like a, uh, a quasi sephirah as we'll see. It's not, number, it's not numbered as one of the ten sephirah. So it can be a little bit confusing, but we'll explain it. Um, Da'ath is not an emanation, but an action performed by the uniting of two sephirah. So when they unite and co-mingle, then you, then you get this. This is more of an action than it is an attribute. This can be shown in a simple formula. Wisdom plus understanding equals knowledge. And as we've seen, Da'ath is literally translated into knowledge. But it has more of a deeper connotation than that, too. The Hebrew word Da'ath, knowledge, has the connotation of intimate coupling, as in Adam knew Eve and she bore a son. So that, that word knew, the knowledge, that's Da'ath. So you can see like, how it represents here. It is an intimate coupling, like an alchemical coupling. This word also gives us insight into the deeper meaning of the tree of knowledge. Because we may, maybe we talk about there's two trees in the garden. One is the tree of life, which is this. The other is the tree of knowledge, of, tree of, knowledge of good and evil. And that's, that's this process, this alchemical process that's, that the Master Samael talks a lot about. So... Uh, Knowledge is a union of wisdom and understanding, and it is precisely this union that gives birth to the emotions. So right off the bat, we have a triad now. The first triad of, of Sephiroth equals the intellectual faculties. Okay? As we've seen, we've got, we got, we got will, we got wisdom, understanding, and, and knowledge. This, this is counted in that triad. This shows that the process that is taken in order to develop an idea which comes from a will. This is the process that... that Every idea goes, goes through now. But we're talking about the original idea of creation. 
we have seen a will to create, which is Keter, emanate into a flash of insight, which is, well, I'll try to use the English words, which is wisdom. It's become analyzed and created upon through understanding. And finally, through contemplation, which is, un which is knowledge that comes from the union of wisdom and understanding, the idea will become emotionally invested in, as we'll see. So as we'll see, knowledge gained through the union of wisdom and understanding awakens the emotions. Okay, so now we're going to keep going down the different Sephiroth. As said, the fourth Sephiroth, the fourth Sephiroth emanate from the infinite is called loving kindness and mercy. It doesn't have an exact English <laughs> translation, but commonly translated into mercy or loving kindness a lot too. It's related to the number four because it's now the one, two, three, fourth thing that's different from the infinite. The said represents loving kindness and benevolent grace. It is unconditional giving, unlimited kindness, and total altruism. A said is the free, unrestrained, active expression of love, regardless of the merits of the recipient. Right? So th this is like the for first emotional quality to come into existence is this un unbridled love, to total love. It doesn't matter what the merits of who, who, who they're giving the love to. It's just a total expression of love. So loving kindness is related to giving. This sephirah represents the first attribute of the primary emotions. These primary emotions are equal to the morals, ethics, and emotional qualities that influence the process. So these primary emotions we're going to see have a higher uh, moral and ethical connotation to them. So hased is the primary emotion of giving and is also related to the right arm, including the ten <laughs> fingers. And as we said, we're going to get into why, why it represents the body part. Um, Gabur. Number five, the fifth sephirah to emanate from the infinite is called severity or strength, sometimes also called justice, because the, the, the Hebrew words aren't, don't have exact English equivalents. Uh, Gabur is related to the number five. You're probably catching, catching that, 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 how that's going now. So uh, Gabur represents severity, but also carries the connotation of judgment, force, might, and law. It is the opposite of said. Gabur is restraint and restriction, limiting the free flow of grace that comes from said that comes from mercy. If either loving kindness or severity were totally dominant, or if they remained in perpetual conflict with each other, creation could not endure and its potential would remain unrealized. These are like polar opposites. Mm -hmm. So severity is the primary emotion of restricting. We've seen giving, now there's restricting. And is related to the left arm. Um, so now, Tiferet, the sixth. The sixth Sephirah, Tamanate from the infinite is called beauty. Literally, Tifret in English is beauty. Tifret is related to the number six. Tifret represents beauty, but is also the connotation of harmony. It harmonizes, balances, and blends the two opposing forces of mercy and justice, we say, love and kindness and severity, making, pos making possible a balanced flow of light from the infinite to the worlds. Justice without mercy is cruelty, and mercy without justice is disillusion. So you can't have extremes of either one of these. This is where it balances, and that, that creates beauty. Beauty represents the balance between giving and restricting. Tifret, which is beauty, is the harmony that is the synthesis of mercy and justice. Uh, beauty is the primary emotion of balance, and is also related to the torso, front and back. So moving on, we got our second triad already. So the second triad is the three primary emotional fac faculties. We've seen the intellectual faculties, now we're at the primary emotions here. Uh, the three primary emotions are giving, restricting, and balance. And they're related to the moral, ethical, and emotional investment that result from the union of wisdom and understanding. So now we had an idea come all the way down, now we're getting emotionally invested in it. Within the second triad, the idea is first praised and admired. That happens in Hesed. This is the uh, unrestricted love. It is then criticized and picked apart. This is the severity of uh, Gabura. And finally, it is synthesized into a balanced concept based on harmonizing of its positive and negative aspects. So that would be seen in Tiferet. It would be kind of like when I was making this lecture, I'd be like, okay, got it intellectually down, okay, now, you know what, this is the greatest lecture anybody's ever made. It's so amazing. And I think a little bit harder on it, I think, God, this isn't going to be any good. They're not going to like this. And then, okay, wait. Find a middle ground. Find a middle ground will be okay. That's basically what this is representing in, in an emotional way. So the three primary emotions lead to the development of how, of how the idea can begin to be formed. So as you see, we're, we're further and further defining the idea 
until we find out what the actual idea is. Uh, this leads to the creation of the three secondary emotions, also known as the instinctual forces. So we got, as you can see, we have intellect, emotion, now we're going to get into the instinctual forces. Netzach, the seventh Sifra to emanate from the infinite, is called victory. Netzach is related to the number seven. <coughs> Netzach represents victory, but it also has a connotation of endurance. It represents the act of overcoming of obstacles, the conquest of anything that would interfere with the flow of light. Netzach is the confidence that inspires determination. It is persistence and eternity. Once the idea has been synthesized into its balanced harmony, it is then reinvigorated with confidence and determination, so, so that its development may persist and endure for eternity. So now we had the idea of, say, this lecture, now I've got a balance point, and like, you know what, maybe it is going to be all right. It's kind of, it's kind of that idea. So Netzah, victory, is the first instinctual force, and it represents the secondary emotion of giving, as we saw the primary emotion of giving was, it was over here. Uh, it's also related to the right leg, including the ten toes and the right kidney. So now we're at Hod, which is over here. The eighth Sifra to emanate from the infinite is called glory. Hod is related to the number eight. Hod represents glory, but it also has the connotation of majesty, splendor, as well as withdrawal, surrender, and sincerity. Hod, glory represents the empathy and consideration for others, limiting the, do, the, the, the domination that would be imposed on them if Netzot's victory were total and unrestrained. So this is kind of like, hey, Netzot, I'm going to pull it back a bit. I'm going to think about other people. So once the idea is reinvigorated with victory, it is then reevaluated and reviewed with sincerity and consideration to ensure that the end creation is a splendid glory whose majesty is not over-dominating. I use these words specifically because they're also, you know, interpretations of the word hod, splendid glory, majesty. So glory is the second instinctual force, and it represents the secondary emotion of restricting. The primary emotion of restricting was up here, secondary is here. And it's also related to the left leg, including the, including the ten toes and the left kidney. So Yasad is the ninth sephira, emanated from the infinite, is called foundation. Yasad literally translates into foundation. Yasad is related to the number nine. And as you might hear them talking, when they talk about alchemy, they talk about the ninth sphere a lot. It's, it's, it's related to the cubicle stone also. So Yasad represents the foundation and connect, it, it represents foundation and connecting the task to accomplish. Rep, it also represents remembering and coherent knowledge. Um, Yasad is also also harmonizes the two opposing forces of Netza and Hod. They're, they're balanced in Yasad. It acts as a funnel linking the preceding Sephiroth from the abstract state of idea to the concrete state of action. So everything here is still pretty abstract. Nothing's been actually physically made. And this is the bridge. Um, so after the idea has been emanated from the will, it is created intellectually, which we saw that in the intellectual triad, then it's expanded upon and formed emotionally with these sephira, and then instinctually with these sephira. And then finally, the finished product is gathered and prepared to be put into action. So it all funnels down to here, and it's about to be put into action. The sod is the third instinctual force. It represents the emotion of balance and is related to the sexual organ, both male and female. Okay, so there's our third triad. The third triad of Sephiroth equal the three secondary emotional faculties, or the, also known as the instinctual faculties. Uh, the secondary emotions of giving, restricting, and balance. Um, because they are farther than the primary emotions, right, which were these three, they're farther from the realm of pure ideas and closer to the realm of physical action, they become less intellectual and more instinctual because now they're further from the higher realms, closer to the physical realms. The third triad is a link between the conceptual stages of the idea and the fulfillment of it through action. So this is going to link all these ideas. It was a will, then an idea, and how they all got formed, and now it's going to actually come to fruition here. The idea has been emanated from the will of the creator. It has been created through the first triad, of the intellect that has been formed through the second triad of the uh, of the emotions, uh, yep, primary emotions. It is now further formed through the third triad of secondary emotions or the instincts. So we're getting further and further formed and defined. Now we're at the final sephira, which is Malkut or Malkuth. 
The tenth sephirah to emanate from the infinite is called kingdom or kingship. It's a little tran literal translation of Malkuth is kingdom or kingship. So it shares a connotation with Keter, which is crown, kingdom. Malkuth is related to the number ten. Malkuth represents kingdom, but also has the connotation of sovereignty, accomplishment, and the realization of the divine plan. So here's where the actual first will and spark of an idea can actually be realized. The divine light from the infinite is shaped through the dynamic interactions of the Sifra. First it is, I know we're, we're treading this same ground, but it's important to try and remember this. First it's emanated from the will, then it's formed through the emotions and the instincts, and finally flows through the gateway, that is Malchut, which is the bridge between the seen and the unseen worlds, from the hidden inner realm of pure potential to the outwardly visible world of our day-to-day -day experience. Everything we experience in this world is a result of this process, according to the Kabbalists. Every, everything, the chair, every action you do, everything you see. So if the idea willed from the infinite was to speak, then Malkuth would be the word. If the idea was to create, then Malkuth would be the creation itself. And as we go on, we'll see that the, the idea of speaking and creating are pretty similar to the Kabbalists. So, before the Se Sephiroth, there was no such thing as number because everything was unified, as we, we said. There, there was no idea of plurality. Nothing else existed but the one. Each Sephira and its corresponding number was created at the same time. So it's not like, it's not like uh, an attribute or, or a quality was created and then later numbers were created. They were created simultaneously. So as Keter, the, the, this will was created that also equaled the, the first number. It was the first thing to come into existence that wasn't the, in, the infinite. And it goes on. You know, wisdom is the second thing. Understanding is the third. It said, you know, on and on and on. This is where the, the creation of the numbers happened at the same time as the creations of the attributes, as shown there. That's why they're all related to numbers. Also, if you look at it gematrically, you have, if you look at the center path, you have 10, 9, 6, and 1. If you added those together, you got, you got the number 26, which the Hebrew word, the yod heh vav -Hey, is also equal to 26. So this middle path between uh, mercy and justice also has a connotation of being linked to that, uh, that force, that name. So, just, just to reiterate again, the Sephiroth are organized into triads. The first triad is the intellect, right? The second is the emotions. And the third is the instinctual faculties. Whereas Malkuth is where the attributes exp express themselves as action. So you can see that, that these aren't arbitrarily organized in three kind of pillars and they're in these triads for specific reasons. That's why that picture looks the way it does. Um, the Sephiroth are also organized into three vertical columns as we can see. This, is, this isn't arbitrarily done either. Uh, the right hand column is known as the pillar of mercy. And these attributes, these Sephiroth, are seen as the male, productive, expansive, and giving qualities, as we've seen the primary emotion of giving, the secondary emotion of giving. The left hand column is called the pillar of justice, and it's seen as the negative attributes. Not really negative in a, in a, in a moral sense, but maybe if we thought more like, like a charge positive and negative. Um, they're seen as female, receptive, limiting, and restricting. The center column, known as the p pillar of equilibrium, these are the neutral attributes. These are the attributes that harmonize and rectify, they unify and they balance. So from these three um, vertical columns, you get the positive, the negative, the neutral, the giving, the receiving, the balance, you know, thesis, antithesis, and th synthesis. Uh, and these are the qualities that are in a state of constant interaction with one, one another. They're constantly interacting between these balance and giving and restricting. So for a quick review of what we've talked about right now, the Sifroth were created in successive order, right? From Keter, and they follow this pathway. Each attribute and its numerical value was emanated simultaneously, one Sifroth after the other. Keter crown is one, two, three. We're starting to get a, we're starting to get a quantity, mul multiple, multiple, multiple things that aren't just the, uh, the one unified thing. The Sephiroth are organized into triads according to their faculties, which we've seen, the intellectual faculties, the emotional <coughs> faculties, and the instinctual faculties, as we saw in the triads there, there, and there. 
The Sephiroth are organized into vertical columns according to their qualities. So, like we saw, the right hand is giving, the left hand restricting, the center column is balancing. And they're all connected by 22 channels, these 22 channels. So as we've seen, the, the triads are there for a reason, the pillars are there for a reason, and as we're going to see, these channels are all there for a reason also. They have a specific purpose. So first off, the 22 channels are equal to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters in Hebrew, and they're all represented by these channels. One, two, three, four, five, six. I probably, you probably got to check my word for it. But here we go. All the way up to 22. These are the 20, these are the 20, these represent the 22 letters. And the letters have a more of a spiritual representation than we'll, we'll be given just on the physical, as physical letters. And we're going to get into what that is. So the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are, and here they are. It's not important to memorize them and all, but you got, it's alphabet, gimel, dalad, hey, vav, zain, het, ted, yud, kaf, lamed, mem, non, samic, ayin, pei, sadi, kuf, resh, shin, and tav. Those are the 22 letters. Uh, Hebrew is read from right to left, just as a quick sidebar kind of information. And uh, these ones, because I don't want you guys going back and counting and saying that there's more than 22 there. Uh, these under, the underlying letters, they're written differently if they appear at the end of the word or not. So if this is at the beginning of the word, it's writ mems written like that. If it's at the end, it's written like that. And they have different numerical values when they're written different ways also. Is one of the main reasons they do that. So 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are arranged into three categories. There's what they call mother letters, double letters, and elemental or simple letters. These diagrams show that. Uh, these are taken from one of Manly B. Hall's books, I believe. Um, so there are three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 elemental letters. So right off the bat, we see some important esoteric numbers, 3, 7, and 12. That comes up a lot with the three creating, the seven organizing. And a lot of that has, has root in this kind of, in this Kabbalistic tradition. So the three mothers, as we'll see, Aleph, Mem, Shin. It's not important, it's not important to, to, to know the names of all these letters, obviously. I'm just trying to show you why this diagram looks the way it does and what the significance of it is. So first off, the three mother letters that are represented in this diagram by the three horizontal lines. So there's three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, and there's three horizontal lines in this depiction. The seven double letters are represented by the seven vertical lines. So everything is done for a reason in this, in this picture. And the 12 elemental letters, as you probably guess it, there's 12 diagonal lines. One, two. So that's how, that's how this Sephiroth tree depicts <laughs> that basic truth there. And from returning back to the Sefer Yetzir, that ancient Kabbalistic text, it says how creation came about by ten Sephiroth of nothingness and twenty-two foundational letters. Three mothers, seven doubles, and twelve elementals. The Sephiroth are considered to be of nothingness because they don't actually exist in a physical, tangible sense. So if we look a little bit deeper into this section of it, We'll see that uh, the three mother letters are shown in here, and as we said already, as the three vertical lines. Um, they're the three primary letters. They're called mother letters because they're considered the primary letters, and all the letters came from them, basically, is the idea. Um, they also represent the primary attributes of giving, restricting, and balance, and you can see that because they're unifying two uh, polar opposites in this diagram. These letters, which are Aleph, Mem, and Shin, are also equal to Air, water, and fire. So air in Hebrew is avir, which starts with the aleph. Water is ma'im, which starts with the mem. And fire is esh, which is, has the shin as a prominent letter. And there's, there's three basic categories of creation when it comes to physical creation, according to this ancient text, and that's called the universe, the year, and the soul. And you can see all these things manifest themselves in different ways according to these three categories. So in the universe, aleph, mem, shin, are fire, water, and air. And heaven was created from fire, the water, uh, the earth was created from the water, and the atmosphere that separates them is from the air. So then again we get like fire, the water, and then the balance between it. That, this is all based on, on uh, the Genesis type of, the Genesis uh, creation story. 
Um, and in the year, Aleph Memshin, they represent heat, cold, and temperate. So heat is from the fire, cold is from the water, and the temperate seasons is from the air that separates them. So again, we see a balancing of hot and cold. So you got your winter, your summer, and then your spring or fall. In the soul or body, the Aleph Memshin are equal to the head, which is created from fire, the abdomen from water, and the breast um, from air, which is the Aleph. So the head is from fire, kind of, because like the, the the brain being this big electrical muscle, you know, so you got, you got all the fire up there. The abdomen, because it includes all the, the, the fluids, and particularly the lower abdomen and those fluids that it contains. So that's why it's from the water and the breast from the air, because that's basically where the respiratory system is. Now if you move on, we can see the seven doubles. Bet, Gimel, Dalit, Kof, Pei, Resh, and Tav. So these letters make two sounds. That's why they're called doubles. They have a hard sound and a soft sound. So for example, the letter Pei can pronounce, be pronounced Fe, or uh, Tav as Thav, or Bet as Vet, Kof as Chof. So from that, um, we get the idea uh, of, of polar opposites and duality. That kind of thing is what they represent. So the hard and soft qualities, they represent thesis and antithesis. Kind of united in one thing, because one letter has two pronunciations. And more particularly, they represent these seven attributes of wisdom, foolishness, one letter represents, riches, poverty, fertility, sterility, life, death, power, servitude, peace, war, and beauty, deformity. So basically the idea here is, is that the presence of one equals the absence of its opposite. Kind of, so it's, it's that kind of connection. So if, you're, if you have wisdom, it means that you don't have foolishness. Or a large amount of riches equals a small amount of poverty. That's, that's kind of the idea. You can't really have one without the, its opposite not being present. And they manifest again in universe, year, and soul in uh, specific ways again. So in the universe, they manifest as the seven planets in, uh, in the Kabbalistic cosmology, they, they, they recognize seven planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and Moon. Um, in the year, they represent the seven days of the week. That one's pretty straightforward. And in the solar body, they equal the seven gateways in man, male, and female. The, the gateways we're talking about are the gateways to the intellect, so we're talking about two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and one mouth. So that's what it represents in the soul or in the body. Now the final one, we have the 12 elemental or simple letters. Hey, Vav, Zayn, Het, Ted, Yod, Lamed, Nen, uh, Nun, Samic, Ayan, Sadi, and Kuf. Uh, these letters, they're called simple or elemental because they only make one sound. So they don't produce two sounds and they're not, you know, the original letters. They just kind of have one job to do. Uh, and they represent 12 elemental, uh, 12 elemental uh, attributes. These 12 attributes that they represent are speech, thought, motion, sight, hearing, action, coition, smell, sleep, anger, taste, and laughter. And uh, they're also, because they're simple or elemental, it doesn't have the same connotation. So um, it, it's not like when you're talking it means you have the absence of listening. They don't, it doesn't connect to an opposite in that way. They can be present or not present. But if they're not present, it doesn't mean that their opposite is present, because they don't really have an opposite. So this is the main concept that's coming into play in, in, the crea in creationism. You know, this is the main concept, basically, is what they're trying to explain. How there's three primary sources, and then there's the idea of polar opposites, and then there's these more simple concepts that don't have opposites. Uh, as we just said that, they have no opposites. And in the universe, year, and in the soul, they represent 12 different things. In the universe are the 12 signs of the zodiac, which we probably all know, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. In the year, they represent the 12 months in the year, uh, which in the ancient Judaism they had 12 months either also. Although their calendar is different than ours, it's a lunar calendar, so it follows the, the path of the moon. So like a, a, a month would equal a full cycle from, you know, a full moon to a not being full. And then, uh, yeah, so in the body they equal the, t the 12 organs. According to this book, the 12 organs are two hands, two feet, two kidneys, a gall, there's like a gallbladder, small intestine, liver, stomach, and spleen. Although in different Kabbalistic traditions there's different, they represent different, different internal uh, organs. So this is an interesting part about it. At, on the higher <laughs> spiritual side of it, the Hebrew letters 
actually represent the smallest bits of conscious energy, kind of like binary code, but for creation. So although we see them here as physical letters, that letter actually represents a principle that acts like a binary code that make, is part of what makes up everything in creation. These letters combine together to form all things in creation. And uh, that can kind of be seen allegorically if you read uh, Genesis where Adam names all the animals, but the, the, the process of naming them is actually the process of creating them, combining these different forces make this actual creature. Uh, so from the Sephirites here again, we have this verse, <laughs> two stones build two houses, three build six, four, twenty-four, five, uh, one twenty, six, six twenty, I think it should be seven twenty, but uh, seven stones is 5,040. From here go on and calculate that which the mouth cannot speak and the ear cannot hear. So this is basically just a mathematical formula for how these letters can be combined together. We see that stones equals letters and houses equals words. And as they're making these words, they're actually combining to make things. So for example, if you had two letters, say A and B, you can only get two words out of that, ab or ba, like A, B or B, A. If you had three letters, you could get six combinations of those three letters. And then, so once you get all the way up to 22, the, the number gets pretty astronomical. And the formula for that, if you wanted to figure out, was 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, all the way up to 22. Well, this is an interesting sidebar, by the way. So, abracadabra, we've all heard that phrase. This is it in Hebrew. Um, the phrase abracadabra is a commonly known term in Western society. We, we, we all know it. Uh, children use this term when they are pretending to be wizards, magicians, or sorcerers. Uh, but the phrase abracadabra actually has its roots in the Hebrew language, or one interpretation anyways. When translated from its original Hebrew, the phrase abracadabra literally means, I will create as I speak. So here we're getting this idea of the combination of these letters and actually communicating them creates is how you create. And uh, you know, this demonstrates the power of the combining of the Hebrew, the, the, the combining of the Hebrew letters has. As we've seen in those ancient texts, um, like through the combination and pronunciation of the letters and words, all things are made. So in creation, we say, uh, you know, reminiscent of God's process of creation, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the creation process takes place from speaking, which is combining letters. And interestingly enough, another Kabbalistic interpretation, in Genesis, the phrase God said appears ten times, which, which they equate to the ten sephiroth of the Kabbalistic tree also. Um, yeah, God said, let there be light, as I just said. Yeah. So, um, this, is, this is a good picture for the tree of life, because you see the ten sephiroth, but it's shown as a tree, but the roots are in the higher spiritual dimensions, and the branches are down here. And that's more accurate to the concept of Kabbalah, of how it actually works, um, you know, down here. The will of the Creator emanated the Hebrew letters. This is kind of... So we're, gonna, we're using plain language, because that's all we have here. But we know that these are, these are high, higher spiritual truths. So the will of the Creator emanated these letters. The letters form words. They start combining, forming words. The words will form thoughts. This is a little more internal. Uh, the thoughts form emotions. The emotions form the instincts. And the result of the instincts is action. So we can see how all of our actions, you can follow it up this chain. So you can say that maybe your, your language and your, your idea of your grasp of the language can define your thoughts. It's hard to put into action a thought that you can't formalize in your head. Right? So, uh, so this is how creation comes from speech, the idea of the smallest aspect and how it builds. And God said, which we appear, comes up again. Um, everything in the physical world has its root in the higher spiritual worlds. And then, like I said, that's why we chose this picture here, why I particularly chose that picture. And uh, the Hebrew word for world is olam. And uh, when you translate this into English, it has the connotation of concealment. So when they're saying world, they're also implying that it's a concealment of something. It's a, it's a concealment of, of the light. Each descending world is seen as a further concealment or restriction of the light, which is the divine essence of this infinite being. So world is kind of like a prison or a concealment or a, or a defining of it. Um, the Tree of Life diagram depicts the gradual restriction of light from its highest source, which is the infinite, which is above this, where this light is coming from, to its grossest form, which is matter, or the physical universe. 
That's where that's actually depicting and, and the different processes it goes through. Before this system, represented by the tree of life, there was no creation. Right? And thus, as we said, there was no creator, because you can't have one without the other. There was just an infinite, unfathomable, unimaginable something that we can't understand. Um, the creation of this system of restriction, interaction, and interconnected flow of light in its entirety, this entire system, forms the first creature ever created. This, this was one unified creature, according to the Kabbalists. In the Kabbalistic tradition, this creation is called Adam Kadmon. Adam means man, and Kadmon means primordial, so the first man, the primordial man. And sometimes it's called Adam Harishon, which is Adam meaning man again, and Harishon meaning the first, so the first man. Now, of course, when we're talking about this, we're not talking about a physical man, and we're not talking about the physical sense either, so it's the highest spiritual uh, uh, concept. Now we're going to get into Adam Kadmon a little bit. I thought it was important to add this because in, in the Gnostic stuff we'll get into sometimes talking about a demiurge or like it can be referred to as a, as a lesser creative god but maybe it was an evil god but this is kind of where this idea comes from and we'll explain it a little bit here. So Adam Kadmon, the primordial man. Adam equals man but not in the physical sense of like I'm a man standing here before you talking. Uh, it's a system of uh, orderly system of composition. So it's the system. It's an orderly system that's you know been created for a purpose. That's that's the connotation of man that we're using here. Um, and Kadmon being primordial, it precedes all other levels of existence. So it's not the first man who was a giant physical man. It's the first idea of existence, of of an orderly system of existence in its highest abstract spiritual sense. So when we start dealing with the cabal, we have to really start lifting our intellect up to the real abstract levels and kind of push the boundaries to understand what we're talking about here. But, uh, you know, we think about it and we chew it over, but it'll start to make some sense. So, Adam Kadmon is also the equivalent to all of creation contained within one unified creature. And this is where the idea where all is one and all of creation is one. There was one creator and one creation, and that was it. This is a hard picture to decipher, but all these letters are the ten Sifroth, the names of the ten Sifroth. So it can be shown this way also, as a man, and often it is shown that way. So this is all of creation. Everything we see here, every form of creation is unified in one primary, like primordial creation. And uh, this is an anthropomorphic image. So if we're not too sure, that just means that we, we give it the appearance of a human so that we can understand it better. It's not really talking about a big giant man floating in, in God's light, right? But if we, may, if we give it this picture of a man, then we can start to understand it a little bit better. That's also why each Sephiroth was related to a body part, if you remember. And this shows where they are. And it's, it's, it's more related to that as in, kind of like on an allegoric level, not on a literal level, but like, uh, you know, Tiferet, the beauties in the heart, the foundation we said was the, the sexual glands. Uh, Hod and Netza, they work together. They're not as free-moving as, say, the either of the arms are. It's kind of that idea. It's kind of to explain how these Sifiroth work with each other. So that's why each letter is related to a certain body part, as I mentioned. Um, each Sephirotic triad is related to a faculty, like we saw. I don't know I'm treading over the same ground again, but it's important. Uh, the whole system is connected through the combination of letters and numbers and expressed through attributes. And, and th it is in this image of God that man was made. This is like mankind, all of us. This is the image that we're made according to the Kabbalists. Not that he made us in an image so God looks like a giant us, right? There, there, there's a certain uh, Masonic writer who wrote one time that if an ant, if you endowed an ant with the ability to, to contemplate God, he would think God was a giant ant. And that's basically what we're doing with this, but it's just so we can understand it better. The image that we're made of is that the will precedes the intellect. The intellect precedes the emotions. The emotions precede the instincts, and the end result is action. This is kind of the, on the macrocosmic level, on the large scale, the image that, that we're basically made of. So Adam Kadmon is the highest spiritual emanation of the human form. Not, not the physical, not the physical, you know, it's not, it's not the physical human form, but the spiritual concepts and, and precepts that make us what we are. This is, this is what we're, we're modeled after. And we'll get into 
why a little bit here. So Adam Kadmon is the one unified soul that was connected to God, basically. The one soul that we're all part of. All of creation carries in it a spark of this soul, according to the Kabbalists now, remember? <clears throat> Prior to creation, Adam Kadmon was in a state like that of a fetus inside a mother's womb. The light was the womb that provided warmth and nourishment. So this creation was kind of in like a womb-like state. So that automatically means that it was unaware of its existence. As we can pretty much suspect, maybe incorrectly, but it might be a safe assumption that babies are generally unaware that they're alive. Or if they do know it, it's a really, really uh, you know, lower sense of, of, of consciousness. right? So within the light, the united soul, like a fetus in the womb, was unaware of its own existence. It wasn't aware that it existed. <clears throat> so in order to advance from this state of unawareness, Adam Kadmon, or we could say the, the universal soul, had to pass through certain spiritual states. And the system of Kabbalah, they talk about what these spiritual states are. I kind of left them out because I was afraid it was going to be kind of a long lecture. But we could talk about them later on if we wanted to. So along the way through these spiritual states, a breaking occurred. And the Kabbalists call this the shattering of the vessels. So for, for a specific reason, this unified soul broke into many sparks. The breaking caused the unified soul to shatter into many sparks of soul. So this one giant soul fell into sparks of many smaller, smaller souls. These sparks fell lower and lower through the world and became further and further detached from the light. So they started falling through all these worlds as we saw through all these different sephiroth into the lowest form, which would be the material world. And um, each spark of the unified soul separated and descended further and further. It began to feel itself as individual and unique. The further it fell away from the source, the more it thought it was its own thing. So it started becoming wrapped in, uh, sometimes it's referred to as the clip off, the shells. It started becoming, we can know it as, as ego. This spell, they, they started falling, falling, becoming wrapped in ego, and then becoming more and more self-obsessed, which equal being more like self-aware, although it's really more of a delusional state than it is a true state, according to the capitalists. This separation from the source, along with the restriction and concealment of the light, is what we feel in this world. We don't really feel the spiritual light in this world, because this is, according to the capitalists, the, 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 the most concealed world. This world it has, is most concealed from the light, and that's what gives you the idea of free will and that kind of thing. This is how free will came about, because we're not attached to the light. We think we're not part of it, and we have kind of, according to Kabbalists, we have the idea that we can either you know, want to become part of it and find out and work spiritually to raise ourselves back up, or we can just continue on in this valley of bitterness or this valley of sorrow. Um, and this is where the... This is why there appears to be a multitude of separate creatures. Because the, the further the sparks fell, the more they separated. And then eventually, according to their state of, of how much light they had, they become people or rocks or planets or, or, the, or the, the vegetable kingdom and that kind of thing. Um, and the shattering of the vessels was equal to the original sin. In, in um, you know, allegorically, it's the same. I, I know we also teach that the original sin is the losing of the, the fluids. This is the idea of, of what came behind that. These are the spiritual states that this original uh, Adam Kadmon went through. The idea that he wanted to, the reason it broke, you know, in a quick synthesis, is because he wanted to receive all the light for his own benefit, for his own pleasure, for his own happiness. And, and with that selfish attitude, could not contain this light and it shattered the vessels, is the Kabbalistic interpretation. But it could be implied to the uh, Adam and Eve in the garden and the apple. The shattering was not an accident, but a means to allow the original soul to become aware of itself. It was, it was unaware of itself in that womb light state because, you know, you cannot appreciate light without knowing darkness. So how is it going to know itself surrounded by light until it becomes familiar with the darkness and climbs its way back up? And you can't appreciate unity without knowing separation, according to the Catalyst. This is the idea of, of why the, the vessels were broken and why we feel every, everything is we're so separate and we're not attached to one, one, one another right now. And so that through doing the, the spiritual work and the spiritual path, we can start to understand what that connectedness actually is by climbing that ladder. The process of individual fractions of soul returning to the source by ascending the path that originally descended is called the raising of the sparks. And that's basically what, what we deal with here. I mean, this is a catalytic interpretation, but in the Gnostic Center we're talking about 
you know, the raising of the sparks. We don't use that terminology, but what we're trying to do is eliminate ego, cultivate essence, you know, and then incarnate our higher being. So this is kind of this process. This is the process that we have to do to, to, to raise back up. And uh, as we, we talked about descending through the worlds and that the worlds are restrictions to that. So in the next couple slides, I tried to depict it, to depict it in a way that we can maybe understand it like that a little better. So this is the original. This is the Ain Sof, the infinite, we can call it God. This, this is um, the infinite, boundless, no form, you know, beyond time and space, Omnip omnipotent, omnis omniscient, omnipresent, everywhere, you know, there's, there's no, it's not defined at all. This is why we can't really understand it. There's no definition for it. It's above the intellectual capacities. Um, all of creation emanates from the Ain Sof, but creation in essence and potency is not equal to the Ain Sof. This is a quote from, from Master Samael. And what he's saying here is that all of creation, which we saw as this Adam Kadamon, which we're all a part of, came from this. So creation isn't as high as this. This is above us. This is above, that's why it's above the understanding. This is a really abstract for us because it's the opposite of everything we are. We're defined by weight and measurement and number and space and time. This is not bound by any of that. And since we came from that, it's greater than we are. It's, it's more potent to us, you know, in essence, basically, is what he's saying. And then from there, we see this, Keter, as we saw, the first Sephiroth, which is crown. This is the will to create. It is the first restriction of the light. The first restriction is so subtle that the difference between Ain Soth and Keter cannot be distinguished. Like I said, they're kind of like, like, a, like a, a cup full of water. They're only serving the purpose if the cup has water in it and the water is only contained if there's a cup to hold it. Um, they're, in, they're interconnected and they're inseparable. This interconnectedness is above the world of the intellect and understanding, of intellectual understanding, as we saw in those triads. This was the top of the triad, but it was also sat above it, and that's why it's called crown, right? Like an actual crown on a king's head, it's above his brain, he doesn't understand. This world is known as Adam Kadmon. This is an act of the Kabbalists, they call this the world of Adam Kadmon. So there, there could be a point, according to the Kabbalists, that we could raise the sparks enough, we become self-aware, incarnate, you know, incarnate your higher self, and at some point you could return to the source, this is the source we're, we're talking about, basically, through the Kabbalistic system. This unified soul, where we're all one soul. We're all, this is the creator, this is the creature. That, that's the whole thing. This is before the separation. Uh, Adam Kadmon is the world of primordial man. Then we see that the light further becomes more restricted by Hokma, which we said was uh, wisdom. Yeah, wisdom is a second restriction of the infinite. The infinite being, as we said, the Ain Soth, balance without form. It is the initial flash of insight. Wisdom is the first quality of the intellect. The will to create starts to become bound and defined by intellectual understanding, and thus, wisdom is really the first noticeable emanation. So as it becomes restricted and defined, this is what, this is what we're mainly looking at here with, it, with this sort of picture. That's becoming further defined. It's not being really built up. It's becoming condensed and confined to boundaries and form. So Hokma is considered, or, or Hokma is considered to be in the world of absolute, as, a, as the Kabbalists call it. This is called the world of emanation. It's called the world of emanation because it's the first really noticeable emanation according to these Kabbalists. Uh, then we have Bina, further constriction, or restriction, sorry. Understanding is the third restriction of the light. Wisdom is bound and defined by contemplation. So what was, we start cont contemplating it and trying to understand it. The, uh, the only way we can understand something is kind of drag it down to the level where it makes sense to us, where we can start, you know, measuring it with, with weight and stuff like that. Uh, the wisdom from the will begins to be expanded and created upon. Bina is, is in the world of Berea, the world of creation. So they have, there's four worlds we're going to be talking about basically, just briefly. The world of emanation, well five. The world of emanation, the world of creation, formation, and then actualization. And above these worlds is the unified soul. The unified soul is above and beyond these worlds because these worlds are restricting this light. Next we have Hased, which we said was loving kindness or mercy. And it's the fourth restriction of the light. Um, it's the first emotional, it's the first of the emotional faculties. So the intellectual faculties are now being bound and defined by emotions. Well, it's first an intellectual concept 
instead of seeing it as being built up with the emotions, but now it was, it was this intellectual concept, now it's being defined by emotions. Maybe we like it, maybe we don't like it. It's, it's becoming more and more defined. The emotions take what has been created and start forming it into more definable terms. Hasad is in the world of Yetzirah, which is the world of formation. As you might remember, the, the, the ancient book we're using was called the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation. Same thing. And then we have Gabura. This is strength or severity or justice. It's the fifth restriction of the light. Severity is the second of the emotional faculties. So the intellect becomes more and more bound and defined. Um, the more the light is restricted, the more creation is formed. It's just, it's just trying to emphasize the fact that we're not building up, but we're restricting something down. Because we like to think of ourselves as like the means and the ends, that the most important, so that we were created, we were built up, and this is what it is. But actually, what, the higher stuff is all around us, basically, but we can't really tell because we're, we're in a further uh, level of restriction defined. Um, it's in the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation again. The next, the, there's six Sephiroth in this world. Um, the reason we're bringing up these worlds is because sometimes we're going to talk about in the future, say, the book of Revelations that talks about um, this church is in Asia. And they say it, it's a mistranslation. They talk about one of the chakras. It's actually in Asia, which is one of these worlds. It makes more sense when you interpret it that way. So beauty is the sixth restriction of the light. Beauty is the last of the higher emotional faculties. The emotions continue to bind and define the purely conceptual into greater and greater detailed form. Um, Tifred is also in the world of formation, this world where things are formed. And we'll see in future lectures that in these different worlds they have different hierarchies of, of angels and what they represent too. But uh, in Yetzirah, there's, there's a lot of the angels, the seraphim and cherubim, that's where they say they, they reside. So Netzach is the seventh restriction of the light, and uh, victory is is the first of the lower emotional faculties, right? This is where the emotions start becoming defined by instincts. So here the emotions are bound and defined further, and the result is the formation of the instincts. So Netzach is also in the world of Yetzirah, which is the world of formation. Hod. Glory is the eighth restriction of the light. Glory is the second of the lower emotional faculties. And the instincts become more and more defined and further formed. Also in the world of formation. Odd is also in the world of formation. Then we have Yasad. Foundation is the ninth restriction of the light. Foundation is the third of the lower emotional faculties. Further defining and forming the instincts. Yasad is the final Sephira in the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation. Yetzirah literally means formation. Then we have Malchut, or Malkuth. So kingdom is the tenth restriction of the light. Kingdom is the final restriction of the light. The total concealment of the light gives the illusion of separateness and individuality. This concealment creates physical form or physical action. Malchut is in the world of Asiya, which is the world of action. So as you can see, this is, this is where we are. We're in the world of Malchut on the macrocosmic level. According to the Kabbalists, we're in this world the Sephiroth of Malchut in the world of action. So as we can see, it's not really like, it's not really like, like we we're built up so much that everything was restricted around us so, to the point where the, the infinite or these different heavens or these higher worlds are actually all around us right now. It's not a ladder we actually climb higher and higher to get to, but it's surrounding us right now. But we can't feel it because we're defined and it's so restricted from us because we're defined by the physical form confined to it, we're, we're, we're defined by the senses, by the physical body, which is made up of the physical world, and really, outside of us is, is all of this, like the Ain Sof is around us, inside of us, outside of us, <coughs> we're, we're bathing in it, but we can't feel it because we're too confined to this body, and from, from that kind of idea, we can see some biblical statements make a little more sense, such as, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Because the world of Malchut is that darkness, and the light is all around, but we can't really feel it yet. So, uh, uh, that's the end. That's the end. So, it is a lot. It's a lot of stuff to go over. That's why I tried to uh, kind of reiterate different points, but you want to grab the lights there. Um, I don't know if there's questions. I know it's a lot to take in. We had some concerns. This is the second time I did this. 
lecture and had to cut it down and cut it down. But it's not important to say to memorize all of this stuff, but it's good to have a, an idea of the foundation of what this picture is talking about on the macrocosmic scale. Because the next lecture relating to the tree of life is going to be on the microcosmic scale. This tree and how it's inside of us and what that actually means to us. Because I'm sure when you're talking to ladies, talking about your physical body, your etheric body, you know, the astral, the mental body, that's going to be the next. That's going to be, yes. Who would actually have drawn that, put that on paper? Would it have been one person or a committee or how did you um, yeah. like all those, you know, the, the pathways, the sure. diagonals? That sure, well, that, that actual picture as we've seen from this lecture, was taken from this book, the Sefri Yetzir. It, it describes it, but it wasn't drawn in there. So there are ancient drawings of it, but there, there's a lot of different ones too. Because like we said with this, this idea of Kabbalah, it's supposed to be only oral. So once they started writing it down, some rabbi said, I don't know if these guys who are writing this down are ever going to get into heaven. That's what they said. This should not be written down. And then they started also sort of like a confusion program. So there's different, there's different drawings, different depictions of that, of that actual tree. But it, it's been around since the first century, and, and it got pretty big in the medieval era and the Enlightenment era, mostly. So it just came to them, like to, you know. Well, this, this yeah, this, this whole concept. Sure, like, the I book, know, the book, so complicated. Yeah, yeah, the book Sefer Yetzir apparently was given to Adam by God. This is the, the oral tradition of the Jewish people. So God gave this book to Adam, which can also represent the first man. A lot of these Kabbalistic texts are supposed to be like that. Sefer Raziel was given to, um, I forget if it was Abraham, or it might have been Noah by the angel, Raziel, and then they just kept this from, from mouth to ear as an oral tradition. Or, orally, right? So yeah, yeah, orally. That's why it's a hard thing to really pinpoint. Mm -hmm. Like the oldest, the oldest text of the Sefer Yetzir is the first century, and it's housed in the Vatican, so I don't know why it's there, but who knows why they got that stuff over there, right? But uh, oh. it's at least 2,000 years old, this, this copy of that. And, and it, it kind of makes note that it's, it's copied from an older text. But, I mean, the, 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 the antiquity of, of a lot of this stuff is debated by scholars, mostly because there is a huge taboo by the Jewish community on studying this stuff. I mean, I've, I've talked to rabbis and, and a Jewish friend of mine that's talking about how I was interested in Kabbalah and that, and he, they were not down with it. They didn't want to talk to you about it. There's still large taboos about it. He's like, oh, you, don't, you can't study that oogity boogity stuff because you don't know the Torah, you won't understand what you're getting into. And the rabbi is mostly like, you, you study Kabbalah? But he talked like that so much. Just, yeah, I don't know. But I'm like, well, I know some things. Like, what books would you read them? Like, oh, Sefer Yetzir, the Zohar. He's like, everything's on the internet now. Nothing's secret anymore. So, but they don't, they don't, they don't seem to overly like it because it is sort of taboo still. But it's just a qu quick thing. And I, I got into because uh, I did have sort of an astral experience one time where I was being explained to me certain aspects of Kabbalah. And then I quickly, you know, succumbed to ego and sort of started forgetting. It's like, oh, okay, but it was a really powerful experience for me at the time, but not being able to remember what they were specifically talking about. I thought, well, I'll do the practice, but in the meantime, I got to read the books also because it was so such a profound experience that I had, so I thought there was something to it. We thought it would be a good uh, lecture to start with because it's, it's one of the heavier ones. It's one of the heavier lectures. They're not all going to be this massive, you know, wave of me just pounding you guys with words and stuff like that, but it is one of the heavier ones. But it's some, there's some important concepts in there. And to, and in the, in the next lecture, we're talking about the microcosmic level. We're going to see this is a lot of like where as above, so below comes in. This macrocosmic scale we saw tonight also reflects itself internally in each individual and that kind of thing. So it's, it's important to understand a little bit. To learn Hebrew and everything, that is definitely not necessary for anybody around here. <laughs> not, it's not going to be on the test, right? <laughs> so the rest of it will? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just help me understand. So. <laughs>